So um, this, uh, we're saying that today's uh, session, today's study um, material has application, um, even though every, every area of Torah always has a lesson for us in, in daily life, no matter where we are in history, today's has a, 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 a very much more frontal practical application. And what I was saying is that this, this teenage boy who went to Israel, and he, he, he returned from Israel today, this past Shabbos in the synagogue, he made a blessing. The blessing was that, thank you, God, who grants favors, that whether or not we're deserving of them, and you did me a favor. You, you gave me goodness and kindness. What was that? A safe trip. That is a tradition which dates back um, thousands of years, and the as we're going to discuss, the Talmud talks about four different, let's say, quote, let's call it categories of people who go through things and they have a responsibility to say thanks in a formal way. So let's just start with what we're saying here. There's a, a formal Thanksgiving offering. So as I said, we'll, we'll, let's, we'll do some of this inside and then we can we'll talk more and then there's Hasidic insights. We're up to page 45, third reading, verse 11. It says here, as stated previously, a person may offer up a peace offering as a way of drawing close to God by praising him for some reason. A peace offering, there, a lot, there were a lot of obligatory offerings and um, the holidays are various things. And then there were ones where we just, we, we wanna reach out for God. Or you know, there were holidays, there were things, uh, uh, apology offerings, um, you know, uh, introspective, um, strengthening ourselves, returning to our best selves offerings, but those were obligated. Then there are ones which are more voluntary. And here there is, it's kind of quasi, it's, it's something that's because of my feeling or gratitude, it becomes really more obligatory. So, and here's a may offer up, but the, the, there's, it, the idea was we do have to say thank you to God. If a person survived either, and here we're, we're um, going to go into four categories and we can discuss it a little bit more, but I just want to get go through some of the text first. First off um, category is a trans-oceanic voyage, which the olden days was on a ship. Um, today is, according to most opinions, halakhic opinions would be going by plane across the ocean. Number two is a trip through the desert. Number three is captivity in prison. Number four, and remember in prison in, in the days for, for most of our history, there was no justice. And really there was, the prisoner had no rights. And it was extremely, they were extremely, extremely vulnerable. And D is an illness that caused him to be bedridden for at least three days and from which now he has completely recovered. That person is required to offer up a special type of peace offering as, as an expression of thanks to God for a survival. And this is the regulation governing, governing the special peace, promoting peace, peace, promoting feast offering they must bring to God. So these are four categories, um, all of which can have some application in today. Most of them have some application in today. We could talk more about the prison one, the um, the illness one is talks about the, the severity. You know, it probably does depend on severity of the illness. The practice is, in, at least in some quarters, Chabad among them, that a woman who has who gives birth, um, when, but, uh, after a few days, when she's able to, she needs to have a minion in the house to come to hear. So she goes to say it more in, in a public way to be able to make the blessing to thank God because childbirth. Was, is, is actually it's considered in Torah thought, a, a halakhic thought, a, a very, very precarious situation. I think it still is, although thank God we have the medical uh, knowledge and, and capacity to make it not so um, precarious, but it's still considered a very, um, a very, very precarious time. And that's one of the things, uh, pregnancy and childbirth, and Roberto was asking before about the, the fast day on Sunday, um, someone pregnant or, or recently given birth has a special category when it comes to fasting. They're, they're, they're seen as being in a very, very 
the woman is sitting in a very vulnerable place. Number 12, let's just go to 46, we'll do a little bit more and then we'll go back. Page 46, number 12. If he is bringing in order to give thanks for one of the four just mentioned reasons, he must bring along with the animal he brings as a peace offering, which in this case is known as the Thanksgiving feast offering, he has to bring uh, a grain offering, 40 grain offerings made out of a total of two ephahs of wine, fine wheat flour, half a log of oil, and one eighth of flour and the entire half log of oil are used to prepare, to be used to prepare 30 unleavened breads, matzahs, as follows. 10 unleavened loaves, which made out of a thirtieth of an eighth of flour mixed with an eightieth of an eighth of a log of oil, 10 flat unleavened cakes, that's more matzah, made out of a thirtieth of an eighth of flour and smeared with an eightieth of a log of oil, and 10 and 11 lo loaves made of, out of a 30th of an eighth of flour mixed with a, a 40th of a log of oil, first scalded, kneaded with boiling water, then baked in an oven, finally fried in a frying pan, and similar to the previously described obligatory offering for the priest. So all of these we came up in different parts, two different times. Must bring his offering consisting of 30 and 11 loaves along with 10 loaves of leavened bread, each made out of one tenth of an eighth of flour, kneading without any oil, together with his peace promoting eat, feast offering of thanksgiving. Thus each loaf of leavened bread will be three times the size of each loaf of unleavened bread. Now I'll just finish to the bottom here. The value of the loaves become consec becomes consecrated as soon as they're designated as offerings. And this is a little uh, illegalistic, but it, it, bring it here because Rashi brings it. When something is, if, if, I, if, I, uh, if I pledge, I have a $10 bill here and I pledge I'm giving $10 to charity, that there's a, 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 a value, a, an attachment of responsibility to me to give $10 to charity. Does it have to be this $10 bill? Not necessarily. It's a value. As soon as it's designated, the value of the wills becomes consecrated. And thus, from that point, they may no longer be used for mundane purposes unless redeemed monetarily. In the case of there in the temple, it's not like just like this $10 bill. There, they're a touch point for holiness. And therefore, in order for me to use them, I have to give another, something else value, different, different loaves. Because right now, it's centering on, the, on that. In contrast, the loaves themselves do not become consecrated until the animal is slaughtered. And thus, only from that point on, may, may, may they not be redeemed, redeemed monetarily. Only from that point on, do they become disqualified as offerings if they're taken out of the area in which they must be eaten. In this case, the first three desert camps are led to the temple city, are touched by a defiled person. Okay, so the crumb comes holy. And we had spoken about that they, they, are, they have a certain um, protection for the, for the holiness. We'll talk more and more about that. Let's go back to page 30, 45 to the 45 to the Thanksgiving office. It's fundamental. In, in Torah life, that we have, that we need to appreciate our blessings. And as believing people, if you got up in the morning, first word we say is moda ani. Moda means I'm thankful to you. Because we start our day with gratitude, saying just the fact that I, I woke up, even if something, God forbid, hurts me, or even if I have an aggravating day ahead of me, or I had an aggravating day yesterday. The very fact that, that that you gave me life, God is saying, "Moda I'm thank I, I I thank you for this day, and I, I trust you, and I'm uh, you know uh, I'm going to make it through. How much more so if I don't have anything aggravating waiting for me? And then we go into prayers, to morning prayers, and we thank God for our hearing and for our eyesight and for our mobility and for our basic sustenance, things that instinctively we probably would not think about, because. You know, my guess is that the only person who wakes up in the morning thinking about the, and, and feeling grateful for their eyesight is a person who has a problem with their eyesight, who to, went to sleep not wondering whether they're going to wake up and being able to see. Otherwise, we take it for granted and our hearing and our mobility and everything else. So the, that's human nature. So when, when miracles occur on a daily basis, we take them for granted. And one of the beauty, the, 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 the guidance, a fundamental guidance of Jewish thinking and of our prayers and, 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 and our, our stru Jewish structure is to keep us aware that we have a lot, that we're blessed with a lot. 
but we may need more. We think we need more. We may ask for more. That, that's that's fine. We pray, and and uh, we're, we're humans. We're, all, we're we're deficient in things too. But the idea of feeling grateful for what we have is fundamental to what we could call a healthy spiritual attitude. In uh, in the Sephardic uh, Chabad liturgy, that's the first word of our prayers. Hodu, so from the same word as moda, moda ani, that what we wake up in the morning. Hodu means thank God that there's 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 gratitude to God. So getting into gear for prayer every single day of the year, before we can say the first word, really necessitates us, us being in a grateful mindset. So in here we're talking about a situation that happened where there was reason to really to, to fear for your life or fear for your safety. And you made it through and you say, thank you. So those are, there's something which you would certainly need and, and you're much more aware of saying, I, I almost lost it and I didn't say, oh. but you know, yesterday I was, I was driving down the highway and someone was coming to my lane without, without a blinker and I tried to shift to the side just because to be able to get out of the way, but there was someone right there. And, you know, thank God. And I, that's exactly what I thought once, once I made it through that. 10 minutes before that, driving on the highway, I wasn't saying, thank God I'm safe on the highway. So highway, I'm driving. I know how to drive and I'm watching the road. The question might be safe. But when, when you go through something you're, you know, and, and you come out at the other end, there's a deeper sense of thanksgiving. That's when there's an obligation. So, you know, one of the great Sephardic rabbis of the, of the I guess, uh, two prior generations, one of the last chief rabbis of, of Iraq, which had a, a, the largest and, and longest uh, Jewish civilization outside Israel uh, until the early 1900s, uh, he, he writes that, that he, what we're talking about here, the Thanksgiving, he said that's really something that it, it, it's, it's, you shouldn't, you shouldn't need. It's that, I mean, read the, in other words, the gratitude is we should be thinking about this gratitude all the time, but we're gonna get, we're gonna, we're gonna forget because we're human and we're thinking about other things. Here, this, uh, this when we have such a stark reminder, God brings it, um, we bring it to God and say, thank you, but it should remind us to count our blessings, even when we're not in danger. We, we, we're hoping for not to have such reminders. And here are situations also where you think, you know, uh, uh, the first one is a, a, a transoceanic voyage. If you're worried on a, trans, a transoceanic voyage and you come through okay, then you, the, the instinct is to thank the, uh, the, the cruise company uh, and, and the, the staff and, and because on the ground, they, they helped you. And to remember that there's a God too. And if, if someone comes through a, a medical situation, God forbid, so, and, and, but now they came out the other side and things are good. Of course, we do say thank you to the doctor. And we say thank you to the hospital and the, we, we thank God for the, the, the pharmacology. But the idea is to thank God too. And all of these things, there are these four ideas. There are, it, when we come out the other side, usually there's a human agent or human agents who do deserve thanks. And maybe it's a little bit more of a, a challenge to say, don't just thank them, but thank God who blessed their efforts. So here it says there, the idea of the special peace promoting peace offering. And today's day, there are those four. And there is an interesting that the Medrash tells us that voluntary offerings, and outside the regular offerings when Mashiach comes, 
we won't need, actually it says that in a much more broad way, it says there won't be offerings when Mashiach comes, except for the Thanksgiving offering. It doesn't mean there won't be any, because some of them really will be, but they, the, what the message is trying to underscore is that this is such of such beauty to God, that even when we no longer need some of these connection mechanisms with God, because we're so connected already, it's the times of, of Mashiach, and our best selves are, are at play, and the world's goodness has come to the fore, and God's presence has come to the fore. So we don't need to struggle, and we don't need some of these physical mechanisms to, create, to connect with God. The idea of the Thanksgiving offering will always be relevant because of, first of all, how precious it is to God, and because no matter how connected we are, we should never give up thanking God for that gift of connectedness in our, our, our very existence. So that's a, a general idea. And until today, when, when one goes on a trip, as I said before about that boy, when we go uh, across the ocean, there is still the, the tradition to make this blessing. And that is largely, there are different categories. So that, that is largely because of the idea that the travel, travel is, it has its, um, its vulnerability. Travel has its, its challenges. And, and travel when, when traveling, we don't have our normal safety zone with us. And therefore we thank God for the, the, the safe trip. We do it since the times of the Talmud, when crossing the ocean, because that was, you know, maybe traveling from here to Hoboken isn't something I would want to, you know, use God's name and make such a big deal out of it, even though I'm thankful for God just from walking from here to the door. But to, to make a special service, it's really, it's going across the ocean. Um, trip through the desert, on the one hand, it's, this, it's also a, a trip, but there, the desert is, is really as a, a um, a symbol of being in a dangerous situation and having made it through a dangerous situation. And that, so today's day, that would uh, apply to being, God forbid, in a car crash and coming out. I mean, we going through it, or you know, being in the bank when there was a robbery, one could legitimately, God forbid, should go through that, could, could legitimately make this blessing in, you know, in, in a shul, uh, to be able to using God's name because we're really careful with how we use God's name because that's a, a very very difficult situation. Captivity today, at least in a place like America, it's not seen as the same danger. We we do have a lot of oversight uh, yeah, with all the the weaknesses in any system, including in our our prison system, which I'm sure there are. There is. Uh, there are rules to be able to care for people who are incarcerated. And it's a little bit of a question as to whether someone who was incarcerated in our, a little bit of question, a, a significant question whether a person who was incarcerated in, in our system would be making this blessing because it was, it was a very different type of incarceration. Incarceration is, I'm sure, never fun. And it's, it's taking away someone's freedom and it's, 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 a, it's a horrible thing. And, someone does the time and comes out we're happy for them but um i guess but um here uh, this is in, in we're talking about being in a very very vulnerable situation with people who want to do you harm and you don't really have protections and number four is an illness which as i said it's still uh, i don't know that um you know someone who was uh, who wasn't feeling well uh, you know COVID and, 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 uh, and had to uh, seclude for, for a few days. I'm not sure they would have qualified. If God forbid they had real complications. That would, okay. So now let's go to the Hasidic insights. The Hasidic insights are, this one is a little bit, well, let me tell you. They, they took this Hasidic insight from uh, uh, notes that they ever wrote. We have in, in Chabad, uh, our Chabad literature, our Chabad library, um, we have many, many, many books. And they're all from all their books of writings from seven generations of Rebbe's 
and whatever they, they gave out for publication was reviewed, authorized, edited, and it, uh, that's the way it works. It's, it's something we can use. A lot of the Rebbe's talks were not officially edited. The majority of the Rebbe's talks were not officially edited, but they were um, gone through with a fine tooth comb and uh, with from really bright people who know what they're doing and, and heard what the Rebbe said. And therefore, that's it's it's quite reliable, even if it's not today. They print them with the Rebbe's name on it. When I was growing up, they, the, the Rebbe didn't, it wasn't even officially from the Rebbe. Um, in other words, it was it was given up by students officially. But now, now, but it's it's something that's reliable. But then there's a, a, a different category, which is that when after the Rebbe passed away, in his house they found many many books of notes to himself, not for publication. But it could be, maybe eventually it would have been for publication, but no one knows what the Rebbe was thinking about it, but there were many, many books of notes to himself. And the decision was made to print them. Because there's a lot of wisdom there, but it's very cryptic. It's very, it's, it's a lot of his shorthand. There's some, a little bit of guessing going on as to what he's referring to, because it's not fleshed out. It's notes to self. So, the, and that's the note 107, that's because it says Rishimot. Rishimot means like notes, because that's what the, the name that was given to these, these published notes of the Rebbe's. So the, they chose to put it in here. It's, it, it, we have to try and get into it a little bit to understand, or at least to think we understand a little bit of where the Rebbe was going. But I would note that this, most of those notes, um, those little entries have a uh, something of a date, at least the year and the, the, the week's Torah portion. And, or, and sometimes if there was an occasion, he uh, notes to speak at or something, that he was going to be speaking at an occasion. And many of them are from before he was at Ebbe. Most of them are before he was at Ebbe. So he wrote um, in 1940, just to, for context, maybe at least a guess of what was going through his head. In the Rebbe was studying in Sorbonne. He studied at Berlin, University of Berlin, then he went to Sorbonne. And he was in France, he was living in France. In June 1940, the Vichy government came to power. 1940 was a terrible time for Jews in Europe. And the Vichy government, at best, was a collaborator with the Nazis, and Jews had a very difficult time under Vichy rule, and the Rebbe lived under Vichy rule. So this, the Torah portion of, of the, when the Rebbe wrote this was sometime in late July. And so it was a, like a, a month after the Vichy had, had taken power. Um, we, we do know from various stories where, you know, and the Rebbe walked around with his beard and he was, he was very obviously a Jew. I don't know if anything happened, but he did make notes to himself about some of the laws and some of the spiritual uh, lessons of the Thanksgiving offering. He was living in a dangerous situation and maybe he went through something and he, on the other side, he wrote himself, I, 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 no one knows. So let, let's take a look at, at the bottom of 45, note 11. And I was going to look at um, a, a spiritual understanding of, of some of the, the depth of, of the Thanksgiving, of, of going through danger, so to speak. And it says, if a person survived, on, uh, note 11, uh, on verse 11, all the, although our souls are external, eternal, in order for us to remain alive physically, they must remain bound with our bodies, right? We're bodies and souls. Death is the separation of body from soul, that the soul is now hovering above the body and the body is no longer vivified, enlivened by the soul. In this context, the four situations that occasion a Thanksgiving offering can be seen as four types of danger to life as reflecting the degree of the soul's manifestation in the body. So in the Rebbe's note, you can see uh, 
in very, very, very shorthand, that he's comparing the, the soul and my body right now. I'm talking to you. I'm thinking, um, I'm pretty much on, on all my cylinders. There are times where maybe I'm not on all my cylinders. And also there are times, God forbid, where there's a threat to the existence of uh, the continued existence of the soul and the body. So there are different angles on the level of there's soul and body operating in all cylinders. And then there, there can be some threats that are, are, are weakening of that. So let's take a look at prison. Confinement per se does not compromise the connection of the soul to the body, right? If, if I have, if I'm in a, in a room, God forbid, and someone tells me I have to stay in this room for the next week. I have a stocked fridge, a microwave, lots of books, a computer, air conditioning, it, I mean, theory, I don't have a stock fridge, but let's say I had it. If, if I had all of that here, it would be miserable because I'm a human being. I like to go outside. I like to have mobility. I like to have freedom. But like many of us lived during COVID, the, the, the isolation itself is horrible, but there, there is not as far as, as, uh, as threats a threat to, to life, it's not just an isolation. The virus is something else. The, the, the confinement is, is something that's, that we, we thank mm -hmm. God that we're out of the confinement, but in and of itself, it's really only for, uh, only if I'm saying, which cause anything with the conditions of imprisonment to the threat of a death sentence. I don't know if I read all of that. that this is, it's, there's outside issues that could come, but the, the, the confinement itself is not a threat to, to life. How about illness? Illness, here the danger lies in the body's own lack of vitality. Not feeling well. I'm not, then no, I'm not, I don't have all cylinders. Now, I could be half fever, and have something I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being uh, treated for and still sit by this computer and talk to you. Thank God that's not my situation, but it's possible. But there's a battle going on in my body and it, uh, it's hard to say all cylinders. And it also depends on the level of how much I feel the illness, if one feels the illness. Still, this lack of bodily vitality does not necessarily link, the link between the body and soul, although it can lead to this. It can continue to feel fully alive even while I'm sick. So if I if I have an illness in me, let's say uh, again, thank God I don't have COVID. I had COVID, and I'm not feeling that great, but I feel well enough to, to this. So it's a you know I I, I have a, a little fever. I have a uh, a uh, a flu. You can still operate even if you can still operate. I mean, obviously, it it, it um, an illness can go become God forbid mortal. But the illness itself is it's it's a lack of vitality. That's not threatening necessarily the, the body soul connection. Desert travel. Now I told you before desert travel halachically is about really being open to a lot to outside dangers. Here the Rebbe takes it more literally for the spiritual insight. He talks about the, what's the desert. The desert, danger is in the potential shortage of food and drink, which is part of the, the problem of traveling in the desert, the shortage of food and drink. Um, and hunger and thirst, that I could be on a boat too. But here, it's it, it's shortage of food and drink. Uh, there's Water is a problem. Is, is scarce in the desert. Hunger and thirst weaken the connection between the soul and the body person might eventually faint, which results from a temporary lack of a manifestation of the soul within the body. After, I, I, I could have COVID two days and still be pretty fine giving this class, depending on how much it's affecting me. If I was fasting, this was, today was the second day of, of fasting, I don't think I, I would be in shape to, to be able to give a class. I could sit here and I, I might be able to talk to you, but 
the brain function is not the same. You know what it's like at the end of the Kipper and imagine going beyond that. So lack of food and drink is, a, a, one could think from that. So there is more of an impact on the, um, on the, 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 the full uh, expression of the soul in the body. And then sea travel. Danger here is the possibility of drowning. And that is a possibility. Again, in, halakhically, it's more about the travel, but over the sea is something special, but something specifically about drowning. In death, the soul is disconnected from the body and leaves it. Like drowning is actual death. Okay, so, so take this a little bit further to the inner dimensions because it actually it comes from the same, the same notes. It says, if a person survived either, any one of those four things, on the right side of 45. In Hebrew, the word for to give thanks, which is lahodo in Hebrew, also means to acknowledge. If, if um, when I say in the morning, moda is a Hebrew word, M-O-D-E-H, moda is the way we transliterate it. Moda means I thank you, God. Moda also means to concede, to acknowledge. So if one of you said, hey, Mendy, you know something? You borrowed 10 bucks from me last week and you said you'd, you'd get back to me tomorrow. You owe me 10 bucks. I, I could conceivably say, yes, I'm, I am Moda. I, I, I can see that. I, I acquiesce, I agree. It's the same word as that's used for thanks. So, or here is us to acknowledge. In this context, each of these four situations reflects a spirit, a specific spiritual danger. In other words, what the Rebbe is saying, and they didn't spell it out here, but I believe that's what the Rebbe is saying, is that there are four different, when, when the Talmud uses that language, that four different types of people need lahodos to say, give thanks, saying for, people in four different situations also need to acknowledge and recognize and concede their issue. Um, in in the spirit in the, the struggle of spirituality, and he's going to to lay out some which are where one might not instinctively think that one has to concede a, a weakness. Number one, sea travel. Sea travel uh, refers to chokhmah. You know, back in the days when we met in person. And, uh, uh, God willing, this coming year after Rosh Hashanah, I'd like to go back to in person and, and they could make a hybrid with Zoom. But back in those days, we used a, we used a, a whiteboard. And there were times that I remember writing the, the, what we call the sephirot on the whiteboard. The, the, ten, the sephirot are the, the 10 energies, divine energies, with which God created and creates the world and interacts with us. And we're talking about 10 different energy, the energies are called, the Kabbalah calls them Sephirot. And there are 10 energies which are mirrored within our souls. They're called 10, ten uh, faculties of the soul. The first of those um, expressions of, of divinity, both in the world and in our soul, is called Chochmah. Chochmah means like inspiration. Cognitive inspiration, like you, you're thinking about the problem, and all of a sudden you have a a, a lightning bolt, like they would put in the cartoons, light of an idea, the eureka. Now, chachma is that is it's it, it's coming from somewhere. But chachma it means it's it, the idea didn't come to your head from the ether. It's you have a a, a deeper reservoir of wisdom within you. We all do, and it's not conscious. And when we're hammering away and trying to figure out a problem, well, hopefully we're lucky enough where we get a peak from that reservoir of our wisdom. And then we, we, we take that gift of an idea and we develop it and analyze it and flesh it out and hopefully it works. But for a person who is uh, uh, focused and able to access deeper subconscious, there we say that that is the vast expanse of divine wisdom is called the sea. We, there's within each of us, and certainly within within godliness, there's an entire sea of wisdom 
that way. We only get droplets. Being able to experience divine insight means to be able to take more from the sea. So the experience of divine insight carries within it, with it the danger of drowning in the experience, thereby forgetting to process it in the, process it in the intellect so they can eventually affect and make the emotions. There are, there is an allure in, in academics in general, and certainly within, within spiritual academics, that the thought process itself, the study itself, is so engaging that that's all you want to do. And it's, 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 it's scintillating. Now, the potential problem with that is that life isn't about just studying, it's about doing. And we have to um, uh, digest the ideas and then break away from the ideas and apply them because you can't, you're not going to stay in meditation all day. I mean, you might, but the idea is really to, to become, get centered and get focused and go make the world a better place. So the idea of, of being so enraptured by this divine wisdom as great as that is, as praiseworthy as it is, there's an, an, a built-in danger that you're just going to drown in that. And that's, you know, I guess what we would call spiritual first world problems. You know, that a person has, has access to so much, so much knowledge and spirituality and such a capacity to understand it and to process it. That's great. Yes, it is great. But you need to be able to get out and, and, and take it to a, we said, to process it in intellect so it can affect or make emotions. Because you it can be a very, very smart person and not necessarily a very good person. You have to, it, it, it's because we, we have to work on, on, on our, our feelings, our behaviors, how we interact with other people. That's, that's not, the, the cognitive experience is, can point us in the right direction, but then we've got to, we've got to digest it and, and feel what we're thinking and, 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 and let, it, um, let it guide how we are as human beings, not just keep it from the neck up, so to speak. And the, uh, there was a, I, I remember uh, hearing from that uh, Bertrand Russell, I think it was Bertrand Russell was once um, observed doing something who was a great moralist and a great thinker and a philosopher and mathematician, I believe. I, I heard the story a long time ago, but that he was once uh, observed, you know, or, or caught doing something uh, immoral by a student and the student said, I, I can't believe you would do this given that uh, you know, you're such a, a, a philosopher and moralist. And he said, I'm also a mathematician, but I'm not a parallelogram. That, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's ideas, but uh, life, I, I, this is what I wanna do. And we do, it, there is that, that potential of getting lost in it. And just one more little vignette that comes to my mind. There's a, 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 one, one of the great thinkers in Chabad who passed away last year, his name is Rabbi Yol Khan. So I, I, I had a relationship with him and I, I, I valued him. Um, and I, so when he, he went into the hospital years ago, many, 25 years ago, but it was his first, uh, the first time he went to the hospital that I knew of anyway. Um, he, had, he had a heart attack and he was in Mount Sinai and I went to see him and he started talking to me and I was already living out here and we spoke about, um, there were some people, he asked me about what he was teaching, uh, so the thought in a text with anyone, because I really wasn't using text. And I said, yeah, there's it, it a couple of people but we're using it, doing the text. Um, and it was, it was the second section of Tanya, which is very uh, cerebral and very, um, uh, it's, a, a, it's a, a very a, a deep dive into spirituality. Now the first se section of Tanya is very much about it's also cerebral, but it's about us wrestling with ourselves and recognize that we all have 
be, there's a human struggle and trying to give us tools. The first section of Tanya is, is to give us tools to make ourselves into better people and to give us more self-control. So he said to me, you know, I said to me, so, and, and I used to, he asked me, are you studying it with anyone in the first section of Tanya? I said, no, not at the moment. So he said, just, just remember, even bright people have hearts. And don't, don't, don't just go to, to, to it's, you find it interesting, they find it interesting. You talk about the cerebral ideas. It's, it's ultimately, it's about becoming better people and they just can't keep it in the idea in the realm. So here, this is kind of the idea of sea travel. It's important for a person to uh, uh, recognize, acknowledge, concede if they're drowning in, in beautiful stuff and great ideas, but in other words, but they're not, they're, if they're overwhelmed by it, they're not using it correctly. They're drowned by it and it's, it's not affecting their lives as much as it should. Illness refers to Bina, which is the second of the sphere of means contemplation. As we have seen, the numerical value of the word for patient, is 49. We have seen it 109 way long ago. I don't remember, I don't know if any of you remember it, but it was brought up a long time ago. In Hebrew, every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. And the, the, the numerical value, the word for patient or a sick person really is what it is. Chola is 49. And in Jewish uh, Kabbalistic uh, writing, we say that it alludes to a person who perceives 49 of the 50 gates of understanding is therefore lovesick for the 50th gate. So a person is, we say, talk about 50 gates of understanding, and a person at 49th is just lovesick that is wanting to really, really connect and that there is, they're not getting there. Now, that could be about obsessing on it, just focusing on that, or also not getting to the, 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 the true enlightenment, the true enlightenment is about really surrender to the higher. But now we'll, let's finish this. Prison refers to the middle being trapped. So to speak, in, in the throat. There is uh, what, what something I definitely have mentioned here but a long time ago, is that in the, the saga of leaving Egypt, which is each, uh, the saga for each and every one of us leaving our personal Egypts, the, the primary foe is Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Paro in Hebrew. And the Kabbalah tells us that Paro is the letters for Ha'oref, which means the neck. So what's the problem with the neck? The neck is a narrowing of a conduit between the intellect and the emotions. In other words, our ideas, main ideas, are not filtered down to impact how we live. Because how we live on the ground is very much more emotional beings and how we feel about things. So it, it, things can stay, as I said before, in the, in, the, in, the, in the ivory tower, in the theoretical, and not make it down to how we actually live, that danger that we call the narrowing of the neck, which was, there's nothing wrong with the neck, but it's just the imagery that God created us and is that there, there is this challenge of getting things from the intellect to the emotion. And here, this, that's the prison. So there's the middle of being trapped, that the ideas are being trapped, uh, blocked from manifesting themselves in the heart. The orderly development of the middle, which means the, the um, attributes, proper, uh, proper emotions, of the in, from the intellect can be blocked if we lack sufficient that. The third of those, there's Chabad is an acronym for three, of the first three of this is Svirot, Chachma, Bina, Das. Chachma means this inspiration. That means to comprehend it. Take, and Bina means to take it apart and understand it and, and, and digest it. And then there's the idea of that, which means making it matter to us. That becomes irrelevant, that I care. So in, in other words, if uh, um, you and I speak about uh, someone that there, who is, uh, has a certain problem, and we can only understand it well, but to digest it so that we care and care enough to actually do something, to pick up the phone, whatever it is, that's called that. That is the key to the emotional uh, psyche. So that reveals the relevance of the intellect to our lives, enabling us to experience an emotional reaction to what we know intellectually. It's how we start to feel what we know. 
The passageway connecting the intellect located in the head to the emotions located in the heart is reflected, reflected physically by the narrowness of the throat. And the narrowness of the throat is the idea of the trapping of the, of the, of the ideas and not having them express themselves in the heart. And that's a challenge everybody has. And that's a primary thrust of Chabad thought for, for centuries of, of the, the getting ourselves to a place where we, we think, we understand, and then we feel in, in the right direction. The desert. We're going down the, the even though the 10 sphere out, but um, there's four different uh, I guess sections we could talk about. There's the, the, the to intellectual, then there's emotive, and then malchut. Malchut is the, the, the last of the sphere. It means royalty, but it really, it, it functionally, it, it's how we express. You you think and you feel, and what do you do with it? You pick up a phone, you write a letter, you bring over soup, whatever. But the, 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 it's the expression, which, when properly inspired, can inspire others. In the words of the sages, words that issue from the heart of the speaker enter the heart of the listener. When we're genuine about what we're saying, we're that much better poised to have the words be effective and actually enter, not to have someone only just hear the words, but to have them impacted, uh, to have them be impactful words. When our faculties of expression are superficial, not rooted in our hearts, they are barren, they do not bear fruit. <clears throat> Such emasculated expression is symbolized by the barrenness of the desert. So, in other words, <clears throat> standing up, um, we're not standing up, speaking and, and pontificating are, are espousing ideas, which the words are moral ideas, but we're not there. They're not likely to be impactful, and uh, they're not going to bear fruit. So the idea of the malchut is to say is it, that for us to think about whether we're really bringing our best selves to our words and our actions. Not just looking and say the actions are good. The actions are maybe good, the words may be good, but are, are we really invested in them? Accordingly, these four situations encompass the entire spectrum of the sefirot as well as the corresponding facets of the human soul. As I told you, that we, we have the same thing in energy, soul energies. If we survive or recover from all four of these dangers, by not drowning in the Sea of Chachma, by progressing to the 50th, 50th gate of understanding, by manifesting the emotion, which and that means really, um, and as a so for 50th gate of understanding means an enlightenment where we're, we are, um, truly surrendered, understanding the things more of as our cognitive ability, but it's really, here really opening ourselves up to God. By manifesting the emotions born of our intellect, by successfully communicating our inspiration to others, we thereby rectify our entire complement of soul powers. Yet, even after completing our full self-rectification, we must still acknowledge that God's infinity transcends our capability to conceive, and that therefore there remain before us an infinite number of rungs on the ladder of spiritual ascent. So the, the, what he's saying is that the, the, the process of acknowledgement, of conceding to God, never ends. Because as, as developed as any of us may be, there's no, um, there's no end to how far we can go. So now I'm thinking, I don't have much time. Um, no, I guess we can start with the Hasidic insights. 46. In order to give thanks, and 46 all the way to the left, unless there are any questions. In the Messianic era, communal offerings will continue to be offered up. This is what I mentioned before, that there will be communal offerings, but will no longer be personal sacrifices with the sole exception of the Thanksgiving offering. Similarly, we're taught in the Messianic era, all forms of prayer will cease except for prayers of Thanksgiving, because a lot of things are not gonna be necessary anymore. 
because a lot of things, it, the, the mechanisms in Jewish life is to be able to, to, to get past or to remedy the distance that humans naturally feel. So we're not gonna have that anymore, but there's never an end of Thanksgiving. The pur purpose of personal sacrifices other than the Thanksgiving offering, you know, offering is to orient our animal soul toward the divinity because our, our, own, our ego is, is self-oriented, not, not God-oriented. Certain cases this involves atoning for sin with the offerings. Once the process of atonement will have been completed, and we will no longer have the desire to sin, so then these types of sacrifices will become obsolete. Only the thanksgiving offering will remain, for its function is to express, express our acknowledgement of our dependence upon God, and this will continue to be the case. Similarly, we will lo no longer need to pray for our needs. We will not lack anything. Illness and poverty will be matters of the past. Harmony and spiritual sensitivity will become homeworks of society. So we're not, the need-based prayer is not going to be every day, three times a day, we, make, uh, we pray for our needs. That's what God wants us to do, to recognize our needs, to recognize that God can help us with our needs, and we have to help ourselves with our needs. But the times of Mashiach, we're not going to have those needs. So prayer will consist only of giving thanks as we continuously acknowledge God's benevolence and wonders. From this functional perspective, the endurance of the thanksgiving offering and thanksgiving prayer is merely circumstantial. So functionally, we just don't need it anymore. The, most of the prayer and most of the offerings. And the day in Thanksgiving, we will need. From a deeper perspective, both the consumption of the sacrifices and the ascending divine flames and the soul's passionate aspirations to dissolve in godliness through prayer, which is our own offering of offering of ourselves, serve to disentangle us from our mundane trappings, drawing us nearer to God. That's what it's, it's about coming nearer to God. And as I mentioned several times, the offering, the word for offering or sacrifice is carbon, and closeness is the literal meaning of the word for sacrifice, carbon. Connecting us to him, connectedness being the literal meaning of the word for prayer, it's philo. So we're looking for closeness and connectedness. That's what it's all about. Since the physical realm is currently the lowest spiritual rung of existence, we strive to rise above it and cleave to our divine source because being physical, being human has its, its attendant shallowness. In the Messianic era, however, the physical realm will be saturated with godliness, no less than the, the loftiest spiritual realms. And in fact, even more so. Even the supernal angels will draw inspiration from the physical realm because the, the, the true power and beauty and, and the fundamental voltage of the idea of a physical world is really very, very godly. It doesn't, it's not spiritual, but it's very godly and God's intent. So, so the, there's, in, in our daily lives, in our homes, our food, our, 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 our cars, our, our computer, there's a tremendous amount of, of godliness to be able to access there and that will come to, to, um, out in the times of Mashiach. And in the Kabbalah it says that now while our, our body draws life from the soul, the times of Mashiach, the soul will draw its life from the body because it will be able to, to tap the intense godliness. As a result, we will not need to rise above our milieu and the sacrifices and prayers will become obsolete. But Thanksgiving will still persist. For rather than the endeavor to reach a higher consciousness, Thanksgiving is the experience of that consciousness and recognition in all of God's presence in our lives. That's what Thanksgiving is, opening up to God. As our divine awareness perpetually heightens, our exaltation and its experience will intensify accordingly. We can hasten the Messianic era by emphasizing in our present lives what will be true Messianic times. We live Mashiach now. What's that mean? By placing the emphasis in our prayer on appreciating God's goodness, we hasten the time when this will indeed be our prayer so focused. There's the, the idea, so I can know that we're up to, that in the times of Mashiach, the foundation of our service will be in the gratitude and recognizing God's blessings to us. Start now. Start uh, living Mashiach now. So that's... Um, that. If there are any questions, we can talk about it. If not, oh, next week we're, uh, yeah, next week we're, that's right. Okay. Unless there are any questions, see you next week. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Great teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.